Hey, I'm Jason, and this is Supply and Demand Shorts. Today, we're just going to go through uh, my daily note for the day, a couple of um, headlines about the developments in the energy crisis that's facing Europe and how that relates to the Ukraine war and how everybody wants to sanction the hell out of Russia and whether it's possible for them to do that or not. So I'm going to share some material here, and we'll get right into it. Russia follows through on gas cutoffs. EU-Russia oil embargo is imminent, at least according to some sources, specifically oilprice.com, which was reporting based on an article that I have right here. So let's start with the gas cutoffs, and then we'll get into the uh, and then we'll get into the oil embargo because that's probably the most interesting thing. So towards the end of March, the last week of March, the Kremlin announced that it was going to have Gazprom actually halt the flow of oil to what it called unfriendly nations. And essentially what unfriendly nations are are, is anybody who is currently working with the EU, working with the United States to pursue sanctions against Russia for their war in Ukraine. So they set out a deadline, which was at the time April 1st. And to my knowledge, they haven't necessarily followed through with that on all fronts. Uh, But they did announce that they were going to have Gazprom work on a protocol by which they would not allow a country that was supporting sanctions or had initiated sanctions to pay for Gazprom provided gas and presumably oil, but I believe this is about gas, in their native currency. So uh, specifically currencies including the U.S. dollar and the euro. And so the way it works is if you want to buy Russian gas, you have to convert your dollars, convert your euros into rubles, and they have to go into a special account with the with a Russian bank, and then you'll be able to get the natural gas that you ordered. Now, the interesting thing here uh, that I thought I'd point out is that the Russians are not doing this to Germany. They have chosen, I think, strategically to fire a warning shot across the EU's bow, so to speak. And this could also just be out of uh, economic viability because Germany is a much larger customer. Now, if you total up the energy imports from Poland and Bulgaria, you find that they are less than 10% of the total being imported uh, to the entire European Union. And so it might be more advantageous if you are Russia to fire your warning shot across Poland and Bulgaria than it would be to, say, cut off the flow of natural gas to Germany. That might cause you a lot more problems. And I'm assuming, I can't be completely certain, but I'm assuming that they probably need that revenue from Germany just as the Germans need the gas from the Russians. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, Now we're going to get into the article that I referenced, which is the fact that, that the nation of Germany, the officials in the German government, are now kind of signaling to the world that they are um, building some readiness to apply full embargo, apply a full embargo to uh, imports of Russian oil. So to read a couple excerpts, the German shift increases the likelihood that EU countries will agree on a phased-in embargo on Russian oil, with a decision as possible as soon as next week. However, how quickly the bloc ends its Russian oil purchases and whether or not it uses measures such as price caps or, ta- price caps or tariffs is still being negotiated. The U.S. is pressing its European allies to avoid steps that would lead to a protracted increase in oil prices. Europe's debate on banning Russian oil has shifted decisively in recent days, with Germany and some other countries taking practical steps to replace Russia with other suppliers. Some member states remain cautious that the economic impact of, about the economic impact of an oil embargo, including Hungary, Italy, which I believe I mentioned in a daily note pretty recently that there was an, a, an Italian energy firm that has decided to go ahead and open up ruble-denominated bank accounts with Gazprom. So you already have at least one major EU authority kind of defecting there. Well, not really an authority, a private company, but if the Italian government really wanted to do something about it, I think they would be. So, And then the other thing that's worth pointing out is it says here, all 27 EU governments must approve an oil ban. So that's quite a bit of a hurdle. And then just one one other thing. Um, 
U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said last week that a full European oil embargo on Russia would push up international oil prices, hurting a fragile global economy, and might actually have, this is a quote, and might, quote, actually have very little negative impact on Russia, unquote, which would benefit from higher oil prices on its remaining exports. She suggested Europe could keep buying oil while restricting Russia's access to payments, echoing talk in Europe of making payments into an escrow account. And I'll probably go through the escrow thing at at a video at another point in time. don't really have time to go into the details now. Um, But it's really interesting that she says that because according to the stats that we're going to look at right now, um, physics agrees with her. Um, that attempting to ban Russian imports are not going to have a very lo- well are going to have a very large effect on the populations in the EU, on the population of the EU, which is 500 million people. Um, so this is the 2021 number for what the EU imported on average from the entire world to to fulfill its oil needs in again 2021, and this is all in million barrels a day. So we have 16.34 million. That is what the EU requires to keep its 500 million people driving, eating, sleeping in a warm house or a cool house, and all of that good stuff, um, making stuff in factories you know, what have you. The total that they imported from Russia was just under, was just over 4 million, about 25%. And then what they got from the United States was 1.44 million barrels a day. And it's also worth noting that the total U.S. export capacity, so take this 1.44 million and add what the U.S. is sending to the rest of the world, is 3.11 million. So the United States, just to make up its shortfall from Russia, needs... 33% more than the entire export capacity of the United States. Now let's go to OPEC, which most people I think tend to think of as a big, never-ending, giant supply of oil that can possibly, you know, the taps to which can possibly be turned on at any given moment, and everything will be fine. Well, production in the OPEC countries has actually not reached the point that it was at in 2018 which is cause for concern. Obviously, it took a big dip in 2020, 2021, and took a long time to sort of get back to normal. Uh, But that normal is looking four to five million barrels a day shorter than what it was four to five years ago. And then the other thing to add to that is that they've actually been missing their production targets. So in January 2022, they missed it by a million barrels a day, just under. And in February of 2022, they missed it by just over a million barrels a day. And then it's also worth pointing out that the total OPEC export capacity is 3.88 million barrels a day, at least as of 2019, which as we see from this chart is probably still somewhat in the range. And even that is lower than what the EU is going to require in order to sustain a ban, a full embargo on Russian oil. So I point all these things out because there seems to be an attitude out there politically that, oh, we we should just pull out all the stops. You know, the U.S. and Europe should just pull out all the stops. We'll do everything we can to cut off Vladimir Putin's supply of money that he's using to bomb people in Ukraine. And I bring these things up because I don't think people are actually going to be okay with that once they understand what the consequences really are. All of this oil that is currently being exported is spoken for. It's being sent to these countries because people need it. And if it's going to be sent to the EU, it's going to have to be taken from somewhere else. There is no free lunch here, and there's no turning on the taps, the magical taps with an endless supply of oil underneath. This is going to be a major issue if, in fact, our governments around the world are foolish enough to pursue this policy just out of political posturing because and i say it's political posturing because the fact of the matter is this isn't helping the ukrainians either it's really not so uh just food for thought and perspective um hopefully that's what you will receive here in supply and demand shorts and i'm going to sign off because it's been a a very long day and i definitely got this video out way too late people are going to be watching it on saturday instead of friday which is fine. Uh, but anyway, that's the oil situation in Europe right now. I hope you've enjoyed I hope you've enjoyed this video. Have a good one.